Hello. In my series on A Beginner's Guide to Building Better Worlds, today I'll be talking about Chapter 3, which is about neoliberalism and about this neoliberal world. So let's begin. So we have so far covered two chapters, Introduction and then Chapter 1. And this is our chapter three. Now, in chapter two, we primarily talked about some of the core principles that the Zapatistas use to define their worldview and to actually develop their praxis. This chapter is crucial because in this chapter, we are learning the very global system, the overarching global system against which the Zapatistas are mobilizing their specific worldview and their practices, because we all live in a neoliberal world, and Zapatistas are one example of how to resist it, but more importantly, how to develop something that is counter to and does not follow the logic of neoliberal capitalism. So this chapter in that sense is really interesting because it gives us an understanding of neoliberalism itself. And I think the authors do a wonderful job of not just explaining to us what neoliberal economics is, but also what are its political consequences, right? What are its economic consequences? How does it define itself? But more importantly, how does it create the very subjectivities, human subjectivities, that become a part of perpetuating the neoliberal doctrines, the neoliberal way of looking at the world? So I know the term neoliberalism is used frequently by both scholars on the left as well as on the right. And it can be sometimes perplexing to understand it. But simply stated, neoliberalism in economic theory is a return to classical liberal theorists and their way of defining the global economy, but also national economies. And most of the, these modern prophets of economics go back to Adam Smith, his monumental work, Wealth of Nations. Neoliberalism, first of all, there is nothing liberal about it. What it refers to is a return to liberal economists of 18th century and later in opposition to Keynesian economics. When you start reading the chapter in the very first paragraph, there is a reference to neoliberalism as the post-Keynesian system, global system of economics. So what is Keynesian economics? Let's understand that a little bit. So John Maynard Keynes was a British economist. And up until after the Second World War, the way the world powers thought of themselves and their economies was in Keynesian terms. That is why it's called the Keynesian economics. The main aspect of Keynesian economics was that he f saw a major role of government in stabilizing the markets and in running the economies. So for Keynes then, it was okay for governments to run deficits during the times of economic crisis and to pump money into the market, right, S to generate economic activity. And then according to his explanation of economy, government was also, of course, supposed to tax higher when eco economy was doing better. Now, these were some of the basic principles of economics that were followed until after the Second World War. So what that did was it made government a party to the process of economic activity. And hence, government then also initiated, you know, social works and care of the poor and health systems, healthcare systems. But government had a major role 
in shaping the economy, but also in intervening in the economy. Now, neoliberal economists, and the prophet of them is Milton Friedman, they, in opposition to Keynes, they go back to Adam Smith to redefine the role of government, but also to redefine how we think a human subject. So in neoliberal economics, then, a human subject is a rational subject. That is debatable. Whereas, as a rational subject, we all seek our self interest. Fine. The idea is if we all seek our self interest and we create a world of self interest seeking rational beings, then while we are seeking our own self interest, collectively we are all seeking our own self interest. So, hence, everything will rise. So it assumes a rational subject, and it then makes this selfish seeking of self-interest into a virtue. Another thing that they draw from Adam Smith, which is just one sentence in Wealth of Nations, which is like, what, about 800-page book, is the invisible hand of the market. So what Smith is trying to theorize in his work is as to what curtails the constant rise and expansion of capitalistic activity. The idea is if we let people follow their self-interest to the utmost limit, they will then generate more economic activity, but what impedes is regulation, government. So what he suggests is that we should eliminate most of the role of the government in economic activity and let individuals decide where they want to invest and what do they want to do, right? That is the liberal aspect of economy, which we call neoliberalism. So what is the assumption behind that? So what comes out of that way of thinking is government then becomes an impediment to growth so the next question that arises is how well then we know which is good and which is not good. And the idea is if it's a free market, the market shall dictate what lives, what doesn't, what survives, right? So the market then becomes the chief arbitrator of who succeeds in an economy. And if it's a free market, freer the market, more entrepreneurial activity, more wealth, will be generated. So that, roughly speaking, is neoliberalism. And here are two attributes of it that our authors share with us in the first part of the chapter. So in neoliberalism, markets, competition, and individualism is considered supreme. I just talked about it, right? Work, production, nature, and time are commodified and measured in monetary terms. Now, the second one needs a little bit of elaboration, right? Now, value is then attached to tangible outcomes. Work, the value of your work is how much you get paid, how much money you make, right? Nature, what can we take from it? How can we mobilize it, right? So everything and its value then gets connected to the idea of capitalistic mode of production and profit seeking. It's so deep down that we ourselves value ourselves not in terms of what we are capable of or what good we have done in the world, but rather what we get paid. It's that way of thinking about the world, which is another attribute of neoliberalism. After the authors have given us a basic understanding of neoliberalism, they also then discuss three important attributes or belief systems that we also internalize, but which are associated with the neoliberal worldview. And those are responsabilization, entrepreneurialism, and auto-commodification. 
So let's go to responsabilization. What it inculcates in us, in our minds, and deep down, if you go by Franco Berardi, in our souls is this idea that if we fail or if we are not living up to our full potential and if we cannot make ends meet, we ought to take responsibility. So the failures, no matter what the structural reasons for it, ultimately becomes our responsibility. So focus is on the individual and we are led to believe that we live in a world in which we can do whatever we want to accomplish. And if somehow we are not accomplishing it, the reasons are not structural inequalities, but we ourselves. So we tend to then blame ourselves if we are not doing well, if we can't take care of our children, right? Or if we are not making enough money to meet our ends, right? So that's the responsabilization of, of individual responsibility is kind of, it permeates our consciousnesses, right? Then coming over to entrepreneurship, we are led to believe that it's a free market and we have the freedom to be as entrepreneurial as possible and so that then also makes the individual responsible for their own success and encourages us to think in terms of what else can I do and how can I sell something or excel because I've internalized this idea that it's a fair and open market of ideas and competition. And that takes us to the third attribute which is auto-commodification. Now, if we believe that this is an entrepreneurial world and the more entrepreneurial I can be, the more I will succeed and that I am responsible for my success and failures, right? Then auto-commodification or commoditization is an automatic outcome of that because then I see myself as a brand. I see myself as something to sell to the potential employers or to potential clients. So then, instead of thinking myself as me, human being, I think of myself as a commodity that must be sold in the open market to gain maximum income or maximum profit. We all do that. Those of you who have LinkedIn profiles, you can just read or just go to LinkedIn and read people's descriptions of how they define themselves. All of that is a person offering themselves as a commodity to the global market, right? So these are the ways in which we start thinking of ourselves. What we internalize then also is if we fail, we never look around and see, hey, is there something in this world which is already making sure that there is a limit to as far as I can go with my intellectual and material resources. Now we just blame ourselves. You might have heard your own classmates or friends telling you, hey, you know, my parents were this and that. They didn't do much for us. They didn't save enough money for our college, right? Not realizing that the parents, you know, could have worked hard all their lives, given them a loving home environment, right? but maybe not have had enough savings to put out for a college fund. I mean, the same people do not really think I am capable, I'm intelligent, I'm hardworking. Why cannot the state give me the chance to go get a good education? So it's because we have internalized in individual terms, right? How the world works and what's our place in it. And I think the authors do a great job of discussing it in their general discussion of neoliberalism, but also as they go to the discussion of neoliberalism in economic terms. In the part of the chapter where the authors discuss the economic aspect and functioning of neoliberalism, they mainly cover it under three registers, and those are privatization, deregulation, and financialization. Now, these are the three main ways of thinking and practice of neoliberalism. Privatization, that is one. 
which is implemented forcefully, sometimes globally. The philosophy behind that is, and which we all internalize, is that government cannot do things more effectively. It's wasteful. But if we privatize government functions, businesses, you know, they are mo less wasteful and they are more efficient. Especially in America, if you talk to anyone who believes in market principles only, they will tell you government, you know, wasteful private entities can do things more effectively. So privatization of national assets, national resources like education, oil, that is what is pushed under neoliberalism and it is offered as a panacea for national and global problems. So that is one main attribute of neoliberal economics. Deregulation. So if you retain some of what I talked about Adam Smith, right? If we all and people and corporations are profit seeking and self-interest seeking entities and if we are allowed to expand our entrepreneurial spirits, there is no limit to that. The only limit to that is government regulation. So government regulation then becomes evil because it stems the natural outflow of entrepreneurial energy. So what is then believed in and practiced is deregulation, reducing the role of government in economic activity and letting private enterprises take over. And so that is another main attribute of neoliberal economics. Now, I'm not talking about the deleterious impact of these, but privatization, you can just see. It is being sold to us because businesses somehow are more efficient, but what it doesn't take into account is that there are certain things, if you privatize them, then it becomes possible to access those services only based on your ability to pay. Healthcare, for example. United States is a great example of a terrible healthcare system. This is one of the very few developed countries where you can die of a curable disease because you don't have the money to pay for the treatment. Now that is something where privatization hurts people. Similarly, education. You could be one of the best minds of your generation, but you cannot go and get that engineering degree or that you know, degree in economics maybe, because you cannot pay the tuition for the school where you want to go or the school that can really train you well. But overall, privatization is seen as taking away the function of the government and letting private entities, corporations, and others do things more effectively. And the third one is financialization. Now, that is a bit hard to understand, but just stay with me. Now, financialization, what does it mean? Now, in mid-80s, there was a crisis in global economy, the famous Asian Tigers collapse. So what financialization is, the government, since they didn't want to directly intervene, they made access to credit easier for individuals, but also for corporations. So when corporations started relying on credit and individuals started relying more on credit and less on actual earned income, it financialized the globe. Financialized in what sense? That debt servicing became one of the biggest industries. That is the rise of Wall Street. So if you are carrying a credit card debt, right? you cannot pay it in one payment. Someone has to then service that debt. So the services related to debt become supreme. That's how Wall Street becomes so powerful and servicing the debt industry on individual level, on corporate level, and on national level becomes huge. So since financialization becomes so important, 
And since, since post 1970s, money can move freely in the market. So it can hop interest rates here and there, right? Global economy then becomes speculative. People, instead of spending money in their neighborhood, right, or on infrastructure in their own area, can just float their money and make more money, right? So financialization of the globe then is where debt servicing becomes one of the largest chunks of national and global economies. And if you look at the IMF loans to the developing nations, that they are a great example of financialization because most of the times these struggling developing nations, the major part of their budget is just paying the interest on the loans that they might have taken in 1970s. So these are the three aspects of global economy that the authors talk about under neoliberalism. And they also talk about, of course, the disastrous impact of that. Right. Privatization, what does it do? If you privatize education, then it depends on your ability to pay. If you privatize health care, that means thousands, millions upon millions of people will die of curable diseases because health care is not seen as a right but as a commodity that you need to purchase. Financialization, in the same way, financialization of the globe, individuals all live indebted lives and keep paying on their credit cards. But similarly, nations, developing nations, poor nations in the world are also caught in that trap of financialization. Then towards the end of this chapter, there is an amazing discussion of discourse, Foucault's concept of governmentality, right? And how does it create human subjectivities? And I think it's important to understand it clearly. Now, I have several videos on discourse, what is discursive on Foucault, as well as on governmentality. I'll post the links to the description. But here, I'll briefly talk about what the authors are discussing and why is it important to understand this part of the chapter. Okay, so keep in mind, that before we get to the biopower and governmentality part of the chapter, the authors have already given us what we just talked about, the main aspects of neoliberalism. What is it? What are its main assumptions? How does it function in privatization, in healthcare, in economics? But towards the end of the chapter, what they are giving us is how are our subjectivities created where we buy into, without even sometimes knowing it, into the logic of neoliberal capitalism. And that's why they are going to Foucault, because Foucault is one of the most brilliant philosophers who discusses how a discourse shapes our material existence in the world. Now, if you have time, you can watch my video on discourse, a brief understanding of it, but roughly speaking, a discourse is when a body of knowledge combined with institutions of power, people who speak on behalf of those journals, academic publishes, press, they come together to offer certain truths which we internalize. So if neoliberalism is a discourse, it has certain attributes that we just talked about, individualism, profit-seeking, entrepreneurial shape, right, auto-commoditization. If all of those are produced through TV, media, the way things we watch, the things we listen, then ultimately those discourses are shaping our very minds and bodies, and then those bodies go and work in the world with those assumptions. That's why understanding that we live in discourses and those discourses shape us is important. Now, there is a moment where the authors discuss governmentality. Now, governmentality is a concept associated with later Foucault. Earlier Foucault, for example, in Discipline and Punish, deals with what he calls disciplinarity. A study of disciplinarity was how law 
rules and everything else shapes human bodies. For example, the prisoners. What does the routine do to their consciousness, to their very souls? Governmentality we see in later works of Foucault, which we call genealogical work of Foucault. Governmentality, when Foucault studies larger government structures and how government policies impact large segments of the society. In order to do that, the state, the figure of the sovereign, re-articulates itself as a life-giving force and not as someone who can punish you. That is biopower. So if the state says, I'm here to save you and give you a better life, they then also must generate people who are within that discourse, who are their own people, but those who are a danger to that. So categories of people are created, suspect people, immigrants. These, these are the people that are at the gate trying to take away your privilege, right? Because the government says, I'm here to save lives, and to save your lives, I'm going to banish certain people and control certain aspects of life, right? So that is biopolitics, politics of life, but which then ultimately generates marginalized subjects. Now, if neoliberalism is a discourse, which I believe it is, then we internalize its logic uncritically and blame ourselves mostly always for our failures, blame ourselves for our poverty, or blame the poor for being poor, for being lazy. Part of that thought process is coming from the logic of neoliberalism that we have internalized, right? And that's where the authors are talking about the power of discourse. Now, you are students, I am a student and a teacher. What is the ideal place where we can perpetuate discourses that shape the kind of people we just talked about? Universities. So corporate university, and that is what the authors are talking about towards the end of this chapter. Corporate university is instrumental in not just perpetuating the discourses of liberalism, but offering it as the truth, which you, me, and everyone else internalizes. If we oppose it as students, we are castigated, we are considered troublemakers. As faculty, if you oppose the logic of we are here to produce productive workers for the market of the future, right? If the university then takes this mission that their job is to build cogs for the machine of capital, a lot of professors buy into that. And then if you try to talk to your colleagues and others that, no, our job is to produce critically aware citizenship. Our job is to teach people how to be compassionate, how to you know, be kind and generous to others and how to look at the world critically. And you immediately are either gaslighted or told, no, our job is to give these people a credential so that they can go get a job. So universities see themselves, especially at the top level, as these credentialing institutions rather than, than institutions where critical thinking is developed where compassionate human beings are developed. So how many times you have sat in a class where you've thought about your classmates, not as your colleagues, right, but as competition? How many times you've entered the world where you see people as competition for the potential jobs? That is a mentality, a consciousness generated by certain discourses discourse of neoliberalism, right? So that's why the authors take us to this journey into Foucault, to the role biopolitical power plays in defining what is valuable, what is not, and then the crucial role of education in perpetuating that worldview. So we started this chapter with a general discussion of neoliberalism. 
we learn that it has certain attributes. We learn that it permeates the world. It shapes the world, its economics and politics, but also our consciousness, also the way we see ourselves. And then towards the end of the chapter, after we've gone through what a discourse is and how does it function, we have learned that the very institutions where we were supposed to unlearn what we have assumed about the world are the institutions, the universities, who are perpetuating that. Then towards the end of this chapter, there is a brief reference to the Zapatistas. Now remember, the Zapatistas as a movement rose out of 500 years of grievances, right? Atrocities being committed about the Maya, against the Maya people. But partially it was at the height of the rise of neoliberal capital, especially in the North American region, and that was the beginning of NAFTA, North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement, right? So if we need to learn how to develop a mode of being and mode of living, not in concrete terms, here is a recipe, no, but as being practiced and developed, Zapatistas are one of those movements who have developed their own cosmologies, their own economies, their own system of education in opposition to neoliberal models. So now that we understand some of the core principles of the Zapatista movement, which we learned in chapter two, and some aspects of neoliberalism and how it shapes the economy, the politics, and our own subjectivities, we are better prepared to learn from the Zapatistas and say alongside them, with them, while looking at this world enough is enough. So that's all I have today. I hope it's useful to you. If you have any questions, anything that I missed, I'm sure I missed a lot, please post it in the comments and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much for your time. Be kind, be generous, and I will now see you next time. Until then, peace and love.